Welcome to the Strong for Performance podcast, where we share wisdom and practical tips to help you grow stronger in all areas of your life. I'm your host, Meredith Bell. I interview experts who offer real world experiences that you can apply to your own journey. If you enjoy my podcast, be sure to subscribe and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. Welcome to the Strong for Performance podcast. I am your host, Meredith Bell, and I am committed to interviewing guests who will inspire and challenge you. And that will definitely be the case today with my very special guest. If you enjoy my show, be sure to rate and review it on your favorite podcast platform. My podcast is brought to you by my company, Performance Support Systems. We publish software tools and books for improving the way people communicate with each other at work. You can learn more at growstrongleaders.com. And today I am very excited to have as my guest, Krista Grasso. Krista, welcome to my show. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here today. Well, I am too. There's so much for us to go into and um, I'll build up the curiosity of my listeners by uh, describing some of your background because at first uh, they may think, whoa, how's this going to relate to, you know, my work and my life? Everything Krista does is so relevant. She is a lean business consultant. And I'm sure you've heard that term before. She is going to bring it to life for us in some very special ways. She's the creator of the Lean Out Method, this wonderful planner called the 90-Day Lean Out Planner. And she's the host of the Lean Out Your Business podcast. Get the theme? (laughs) She has been helping businesses achieve accelerated results and increased profitability for two decades through a combination of things that she's very passionate about, but not everyone is. And that's why I'm so excited to have her with us. And those two things are strategic planning and lean business practices. In fact, Krista is known as the business optimizer because she has the ability to quickly cut through the noise and focus on optimizing the core things that make the greatest impact in growing and scaling a business. She specializes in helping businesses identify the most important things they should focus on right now that will drive maximum value for their customers and maximum profits for their business. And Krista, what's especially interesting to me is that you have worked and are working right now, I think, with an F. 10 company, Fortune 10 company, and yet you also work with very tiny companies, um, individual solopreneurs. And what's interesting is there are so many common issues, even across those different sizes of organizations. So the first thing I want to find out is how did you come to be an expert in lean Uh, methodology, because I know you have a very interesting and unique story and path. I do. And so I think this happens to so many of us, right? We set out early years um, in our careers and we we never really quite know where it's going to take us. And I had graduated college. I had an MIS degree in management information systems, and I was interviewing and looking for work. And I ended up having one of my morning customers at Starbucks, which I was managing at the time, offer me a job one day. And he had said, you know, I'd really love to get you in. I think you'd be great for this company, but I'd really like you to start tomorrow. And the only way I could get you to start tomorrow is if you come in as a consultant. I honestly had no idea what consultant even meant. I said, sure, sign me up. I was excited. I was getting my first job. (laughs) And um, it just so happened that I fell into consulting um, just through that opportunity. But the company that I was brought into also was very big into lean manufacturing. So I also fell into lean manufacturing a little bit. And ironically, I had started my college experience um, pursuing a degree in fine arts. I always wanted to have my own business 
business and really focus on something creative. And so I never would have thought that I would spend 20 plus years doing consulting and lean consulting, but I absolutely loved it. I completely fell in love with it and have done it ever since and have leveraged it, as you mentioned, not just with the big, huge companies that I work with, the Fortune 50, Fortune 10 clients, but also with solopreneurs and entrepreneurs and small business owners. And I think there's even applicability just in our everyday lives. <laughs> and that's what I love about what you do, because it's it sounds you know, kind of conceptual here, lean, it sounds, oh, people associate it with manufacturing and and things that may not be too exciting, but in fact, it's so practical. And so before we delve in deeply, I think it would be really helpful. What is meant by lean? Where did that term come from? And how did you come up with the term lean out? Because I think that's very significant to everything else we're going to be talking about. Yeah, absolutely. So lean in its kind of most basic sense is about um, eliminating waste. So you're getting rid of all of the waste and the things that don't matter in what you do and increasing value. And if you think about everything that we do from our lives to any type of business of any size, we always want to be focused on the most valuable things and eliminating the things that are not adding value right? That's how we get our time back. It's how we end up in alignment and doing things that are more fulfilling. So I think that lean in general applies everywhere. And it really grew up in manufacturing, um, really in automotive specifically. And they were looking, this was back uh, Toyota back in the day in the early 1900s, and they were looking at ways to improve the efficiency of producing vehicles. And they lean itself wasn't coined as a term until I think 1980s. Um, but they really Really looked at the entire manufacturing production system and looked at ways to eliminate waste and improve quality. Um, and it was really revolutionary to the automotive industry. And a lot of other companies studied how they did it. Um, it was called the, the Toyota Production System, TPS. And companies had studied it. And that was where books had come out. And people had really analyzed how they were able to make such dramatic changes and improvements. And it became really commonly used across any type of manufacturing company. Fast forward many decades and or uh, many years, and it then became something that people started using in more of your software development type space in corporate. Um, but where I see a big gap and where I developed the term lean out and the whole lean out method is I think it doesn't need to be exclusive to manufacturing or to software development. I think it should be for all businesses of all sizes. And especially those of us who have online businesses like coaching or consulting or you know any sort of online, anything in the online space, I think there's a huge need for lean. Um, and I don't really see anybody else teaching it or targeting that market. So that's where, where my method came in. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you know, just the little bit you said just there about finding the, getting rid of the waste and focusing on what's really important, you actually have a four-step process that I think is brilliant in terms of helping people, you know, not feel intimidated by it and understand exactly what needs to be done. Would you walk us through that? Because I think it'll really help people see how concrete this approach really is. Yeah, I'll walk you through the four steps and then we could dive deep into any part of it if you'd like. Um, so there's four main pillars of Lean Out Method. And the very first one is context. And I think with anything we do in life, I think it's super important to start with the end in mind, to know where we're going, to know why it's important to us, and then to reverse engineer our results. And so when you start with context, it's really starting with what is that long-term vision? What is that vision that you have for your business, for your life, for your customers? What does the future look like? And what are you, what is the end state that you're trying to build an entire business or life around? Um, and so you start there and then you create a business model that's in alignment with that. And so that's context at a high level. Context to me helps answer the question, is this the right thing? So you're able to say, as you're making decisions in your day to day, you know, am I working on the right thing? Am I investing time, money and energy and things that matter? Well, context helps you say, is it the right thing? 
clarity helps you answer the question, is it the right thing right now? And so the second pillar is clarity. And that's where you take that longer term vision and you break it down into a plan for the next 90 days. You look at what are the things that are important right now. And so you'll build a higher level roadmap, but really get focused on the next 90 day period of time, which is where you can make really big, significant transformations and improvements in your business or life. Um, next is commitment. And that is really, truly committing and going all in and getting it done and not in a, I'm going to work myself to the bone or work 24 by seven kind of way, but in a, when I hit challenges or when mindset blocks come up and when those things come up, I'm going to keep going anyway. I made a commitment to this. I'm going to work through it. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to be resourceful. And so that's commitment. And then the fourth pillar is Kaizen, which is a lean concept, which is all about making small, continuous improvements and changes for the better. And to me, that's where the art of reflection comes in. It's where looking at your actual metrics and your data and analytics comes in. It's looking at what's working and what do I want to do more of and double down on and what's not working that I either want to eliminate and lean out or that I want to reimagine to try to get better results. Mm -hmm. So at a high level, those are the four pillars and, and process. That's great. So when I think about people who come to you for help, which of these areas do you find are the ones they're struggling with the most? It's a little bit of all of them, but it's really interesting because I think most people come in for clarity. They come in thinking, I need a plan. There's something I want to do, or I'm not getting the results that I want in my business. So can you help me develop a strategic plan around it? And, or can you help me develop systems around it? And the answer is always yes. But what we usually find is the reason they're not getting the results that they want, or the reason why they're very overworked or very overwhelmed or struggling in what they're doing is because of the context gap. They either no longer are working on things that support their vision. Or over the years, their business model has kind of grown out of alignment. They started saying yes to a lot of different things. They started experimenting with a lot of things. They've grown um, and evolved as a person or as a business. And the, th the things and the ways that they used to do it are no longer serving them for where they want to go. And so they think they need a strategic plan and they do, but really they need to reset their entire context to get that clarity on what's important long-term and make sure that they have that ecosystem for success around them that supports them getting there. Then they create the plan in alignment with that. So mm -hmm. that's usually how it goes. <laughs> That makes a lot of sense uh, because we can get into this doing, doing mode and repeating things we've been doing without pausing long enough to, as you say, reflect and say, am I really getting the results I want by doing the things that I'm doing? What do you see are the things that clients are most resistant to when you say, here's what I think you ought to do but they're in love with something, you know, as far as a, a vision they had or a way of doing things, how do you help them, you know, get past that resistance and adopt or try something different? Yeah, absolutely. Because if you think about the concept of leaning out is so logical, of course, you want to eliminate waste and you want to double down on and do more of what's working. I don't think anybody's going to argue with that, but boy, is it hard for people to let go of things. <laughs> Yeah. And it's really hard to let it go, especially because I think as entrepreneurs, sometimes, or even, you know, as professionals, our identity gets so wrapped up in what we do, mm -hmm. that when you stop doing something, you have an almost challenge to your identity. It's like, well, who am I if I'm not doing this anymore? I'm the go-to person for this. Am I still going to be valuable? Are people still going to want to work with me or want to hire me if I'm no longer doing that thing? And so it can be really hard for people to let go of things. <laughs> um, and so we spend a lot of time and we work through that. And again, it all comes back to having that clarity of the end state and where they want to go and just simply looking, it's trade-offs, right? It's really ultimately about trade-offs. If you keep doing this thing, you're taking up time, you're taking up money, you're taking up energy, you're taking up space for something that's not actually in alignment with where you want to go. Mm 
So not only is it keeping you stuck where you are, but it's preventing you from moving towards where you want to go. Mm -hmm. And so it's a matter of how important is that vision for you? How important is that end state that you say you want? And is that more important than holding on to what you currently have? Um, And then the second piece of that is if they do agree to finally let something go, you do have to practically put a plan in place to be able to transition out of doing something that you've done for a really long time or to shut down an offer that maybe people are relying on you for. It's not a band-aid approach. You do have to really thoughtfully and strategically look at how can I create for my next, you know, space for my next level and what's next and how can I transition what I'm no longer going to be doing in a way with integrity that still gives my clients results or still gives my, you know, company results and really look at that whole holistic picture. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm picturing that in some cases you probably almost need to hold their hand to encourage them as they're shifting from this old way of doing things to adopting new behavior. I know from our own work that, you know, when we're moving from the old to the new, the brain has to really rewire itself. It doesn't happen overnight or automatically. And so there's this period of time that they're going to be feeling uncomfortable, right? And so how do you support them as they're going through that awkward phase of making that transition? Because I'm thinking of my listeners who may be thinking, man, I've been wanting to change this and I just haven't done it because I'm afraid of not being able to stick with it or not having the support system. How do you support people with that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think to me, that's where the commitment pillar comes in, right? It's like, is this important? Because if it is, you got to push through, you got to work through the mindset stuff that comes up. You got to work through the stuff that comes up because it's never super easy. It's not like you say, I want to do something and it just auto magically happens, right? You always have to go through some sort of journey to get there. And there tends to be a lot of ups and downs in that journey. Um, But one of the things that I teach people to do is listen for where they say, yeah, but the yeah buts are where you end up seeing and feeling a lot of resistance. And people go through a natural cycle mm-hmm. where we'll talk about something and they'll be really excited. And then I'll get the frantic emails or phone calls. Yeah, but I thought about it. And yeah, but what if? And so <laughs> I train people to listen for the yeah buts mm-hmm. um, so that they can catch themselves And I think it helps them know going in that it's going to happen. So it's not, they're kind of prepared for the fact that they're going to meet resistance, that yeah, butts are going to come up and that this is a normal part of the process and that they do need to keep going through. And I do give them some tools also to be regrounding themselves back in some of those core questions. Like, I know that you've always done this. I know that it's gotten you results in the past, but we already talked about the fact that this does not align with what you want to do next. And remember by, you know, eliminating this, by leaning this out, this is what you're going to be able to do instead. And so it's keeping them focused on the future instead of looking to the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, I used to do this. I always did this. Yeah, but, um, and it's yes. And you're going to be able to create this space for this, which is what's going to get you the results that you want. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's so important. Well, I would love for you to share uh, your experience with your jewelry business, because uh, I didn't mention that in your introduction, but you, besides having this very left brain, you know, lean out methodology, you have this other very creative side to yourself that you actually needed to apply this methodology to for your business. And I think that would be helpful for people to hear about your experience on that and that line of work. Yes. And I'm at such a weird balance of left brain, right brain. So I need both to kind of stay sane. One always balances out the other. Um, But I did always want to do my own business and I wanted to do something creative. So back in 2004, I launched my very first jewelry business. Um, Over the years, I evolved that and I ended up creating a business that I scaled really quickly 
really, really quickly. And I scaled it honestly a little bit too quickly and almost put myself out of business. And what ended up happening was I made a lot of rookie mistakes in that business, um, which when you have a product-based business, mistakes get really expensive really quickly (laughs) because Mm -hmm. you're investing in a lot of product. And so, you know, I designed these amazing collections that I was absolutely certain were going to sell. They did not. Um, I hired, you know, these big press and PR firms thinking that all I needed was for people to be aware of me. They did not. (laughs) It did not work. Um, And so I made a lot of, you know, mistakes focusing on kind of the wrong things instead of the things that I needed to focus on. And I ended up in a place where I'd been working with these showrooms and I'd been working with these sales reps and I was getting a lot of pressure from them saying, listen, you've got to drop your prices. You've got to move production to China. And for me, I really took a lot of passion in making my product in the U.S. and having a really high quality product. And I didn't want to do that. And at the same time, we were just like drowning in debt because we had invested in all of these, you know, um, collections and all of these people and did not get the return on that investment. And so I was at this crossroads where I was looking at, do I need to close this business? Do I need to seriously consider moving production to China? Like, what do I do? Because I can't keep going the way that I'm currently going. I love the jewelry and I, it, it looks like everything's going really well, but behind the scenes, it's a total hot mess. And <laughs> that was where I had my epiphany moment where I paused and took some time to reflect. And I think, you know, for your listeners, anytime when you're in that place of almost like desperation and everything feels so overwhelming, the last thing you feel like you can take the time to do, but the most important thing that you should do is take time back and just reflect. And that was what I did. And I really looked at it and I was like, wait a minute, I am brought in by some of the biggest companies in the world to help them scale their business, to help them lean out their business, to help them develop systems. And I am getting them such amazing results. Like they're having incredible profit increases, incredible efficiency increases. They aren't experiencing any of the problems that I'm experiencing in my own business. What gives? And I realized I'm not applying any of the things in my own business that I'm (laughs) consulting with them to do because in my mind, it was this discrepancy. I'm working with these big Fortune 500 companies or Fortune 50 and like you had mentioned most recently, Fortune 10, right? And that's different than my little jewelry business. And the thing was, it's not. The principles themselves are universally applicable. It was just a matter of looking at how do I take the the principle, how do I take the concept and apply it to a business of my size, my scale, my type? And I will tell you that made all of the difference. A, we got ourselves out of debt, ended up being really wildly successful and profitable. I kept all of my production in the US um, and maintained all of my quality while dropping the prices of my jewelry because we were able to get so much more efficient by leaning things out that I was actually able to cut enough costs that I could completely transform how I priced and made and approached my product. So that was actually the birth of the lean out method. I'd been doing lean for so many years, but that was what caused me to recognize I have something here that small businesses and and entrepreneurs and solopreneurs need to. Mm -hmm. Such a fabulous story. I'm really curious because I think there's, again, applicability for my listeners. Tell us one or two things that you changed in your business that you decided to do differently with that, that allowed you to get out of debt, that allowed you to become more productive and and really build a successful business instead of one that was struggling so much? Yeah, one of the, I think the two things and they kind of interrelate is A, I put systems in place. I feel like when you want to scale and you want to scale in a really simple, sustainable way, you absolutely need to have systems. But then the second piece of that was I started to look at my business as a business instead of looking at my business as an artist. And I work with a lot of super passion fueled entrepreneurs. And I will tell you, they almost look at their business sometimes like an artist, even though they don't have a creative business because they're so focused on their passion that they aren't thinking and making decisions with a business owner's hat on. 
And I think that is one of the keys. So I changed the way I designed my products. It's I designed like an artist. I made it as intricate and complex and time consuming as could possibly be. And you know what? None of my customers ever noticed or cared. Like I was thinking like an artist and was like, yeah, but it's going to be so much better if I do this. And if I solder this jump ring and if I nobody cared whatsoever and I was increasing the complexity and I was increasing the cost um, by changing the way that I designed the pieces so that they were equally as beautiful. The quality was equally as high, but I took the artist flair out of it and thought like a business person. Um, and I think a part of that was I used to just design to design and then I'd figure out how much it cost me and I'd price it from there. Instead, I went into my designs saying for a necklace of this type, I want to charge this much. How do I design a piece of jewelry that's going to actually give me the profit margin that I need? Mm. And so I reverse engineered my results instead of just designing for the fun of it and then figuring out, oh, well, that needs to be $88. Meanwhile, somebody wants to charge or pay $48 for it. And so that was a really big piece of it. And those systems made everything that we did repeatable. Um, instead of spending so much time looking for this or trying to find this, or even sometimes I'd get an amazing deal on beads that I was using or a particular, you know, plater that I'd be working with. And then I didn't have the system in place. So I'd have to kind of start from scratch when I was out of supplies or when I was out of something and needed oh. to do it again. So putting that consistency and repeatability in place made for a better customer experience. They were always getting the same thing when they ordered from me. And it just made our operations and how we ran the business so much easier. And again, more repeatable and more predictable. Mm. Excellent. Yeah. It, it, and so when I think about, you know, someone who might be saying, Oh, I work so many hours, you know, every week. I'm having to put in so much time. My guess is you would say, show me your systems, <laughs> right? Show me what systems you have in place. What are the key system areas that you find if somebody addresses it, it can make just a huge difference in getting a breakthrough to saving them time to having that efficiency that you were just talking about? Oh yeah, absolutely. There's so every business, like a business itself is a system. And then within your business system, there are other systems. And if you think about like financial management, really important, if you want to be profitable, that you understand profit margins and how you're collecting payments and what you do if a payment fails. And like, there's just all of that kind of practical running of the business and collecting of the money, but also the strategic decisions around how you want to price things and profit margin and things of that nature. Um, there's sales and marketing, right? So how do you make the world aware of you and what you do? And how do you um, continue to nurture them until they're to the point that they're ready to make a buying decision? There's your offers and your funnels. And so there's, you know, the, to me, sales and marketing is how your offers and your funnels is what. So what is it that you actually do? How do you help people? Um, what is the offer that you're trying to market and sell? Um, and then there's many others, but to me, a big piece of this is lean out method. It's to me, lean out method is a system that you need in your business that looks at that strategic planning. And it's, I call the version of strategic planning that I do lean strategic planning. No surprise there. No. Um, but <laughs> Well, I think strategic planning is critical and super important in any business. I think a lot of people overdo planning. They spend so much time planning that they don't spend enough time actually implementing the plan, which is where uh -huh. the results come from. Um, so I leverage lean strategic planning, which is to me, one of the core systems in your business, because you and your team have to have clarity on what to be focused on. Because without that clarity, that's where you do overwork. That's where you do end up overwhelmed and you end up investing a ton of time in things that don't actually matter or don't matter right now. And so the lean strategic planning gives you that clarity of right things right now so that you can be laser focused. And if you plan in a way that you consider your capacity, um, which I think capacity based planning is really important, you can create your plans and get your results without having to work more than you want to work. Mm -hmm. Well, thinking about that, you know, we hear about these 90 day plans. What is the magic about 90? 
that honestly, it's like that sweet spot of time where it's long enough that you can get a really significant result, but it's short enough that you can stay motivated and stay focused and not lose that momentum that you do if you think about a full year right? It's just, and it's three months, right? There's something about threes, um, but it gives you just that amount, right amount of time where I feel like you can develop a high level plan. You can refine and add your detail as you go through. And you've got, if you think about a monthly checkpoint, you've got three different opportunities to be pivoting and adjusting so that at the end of that 90 days, you can achieve some pretty phenomenal results. I mean, in 90 days, you can go from idea to fully launching a brand new offer. Um, in 90 days, you can achieve almost any goal um, that you really want with enough planning and enough focus. And I think, you know, look at those four 90 day periods in a year, and it is incredible what you can do. But what I find with people who actually put focused effort on a 90 day plan is they frequently will get more done in that 90 days than they would have gotten done in a year otherwise. And it's because of the focused action. I'll tell you, I'm so excited and motivated just listening to you <laughs> describe what you do. So when you do lean strategic planning, <clears throat> what are you helping the business owner? What time frame or time frames are you helping them look at to plan for? So they don't feel overwhelmed, like it's so much to have to do. Yeah. So to me, if you think about the core elements of a lean strategic plan, I think you always want to have a longer term roadmap. So at least six months. And when I say roadmap, I mean like really high level, really high level. Like here's my marketing and launch events or the, the main things that I'm going to be doing for the next six months or even year. Then when you get to your 90 days, you want to be much more intentional. And to me, that 90 days is going to break down into a combination of projects and marketing campaigns. So your projects are the behind the scenes things that you're doing. Your marketing campaigns are your more customer facing things that you're doing. So if you have, you know, whether you're trying to sign new clients or whether you're trying to plan a retreat or you're trying to add a new offer, there's the project stuff that you need to do to get it uh, technically ready for somebody to be able to join or work with you. And then there's the communications, the marketing campaigns, the emails, the social media posts, all the things that you do to try to get somebody actually interested in to eventually join. And then of course you have your running the business and meeting your existing customer needs, mm -hmm. but that's what goes into the 90 day period. And again, you look at that kind of high level. It sounds like a lot, but when you break it down, it's really not. Um, and then from there, what I recommend people do is what I call the 15 by one planning model is if you have that longer term roadmap and you've got a 90 day plan at a high level, you should be able to do your planning in 15 minutes a day and one hour a week. You really truly do not need any more time than that because you're clear on what your focus areas are. And it's just a matter of prioritization at that point to say this week, I'm going to focus on these things today. I'm going to focus on this and that's it. That's great. And that reminds me from your experience working with clients, <clears throat> what do you find is the best time of day for them to do that daily plan first thing in the morning or the night or the day before? And then also the weekly, is it better to do it at the end of the week or at the beginning of the week and why? Yeah, so I am a right before person. So there's a, a lean concept, just enough, just in time. And to me, just enough is the 15 by one. You don't really need more about, more than that. And just in time, as you plan your day that morning, you plan your week. I love to do strategy Sunday. I like to plan my weekend Sundays, but my work week is usually Sunday through Thursday. And I take Friday and Saturday off. So for somebody who did a Monday through uh, Friday week, it might be Monday that they do their planning. But that to me is personal preference. And I'd say probably about 80% of my clients do the same, but there are that 20% that really love to plan at the end of the day for the next day or the end of the week for the next week. And so I think the right answer is the one that you will stick to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really, <laughs> yeah, don't force yourself to <clears throat> You know, mm -hmm. Krista said morning, so I'm going to plan in the morning. If you plan at the end of the day and you will consistently plan at the end of the day, keep planning at the end of the day. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I think that's such an important point. And I remember <clears throat> hearing you talk about this in another conversation. The idea of <clears throat> we get hung up on listening to the experts 
and what you should do here and you should do there. And that in itself can be overwhelming because we're going to hear conflicting things. I've had that happen recently with how should you start your morning? You know, one person said, don't do that meditation and journaling and reading. Just just jump right into your work first thing. And others say, no, you got to have that time for yourself. So you can drive yourself crazy trying to listen to everyone else. How do you guide a client who's feeling overwhelmed by too many voices that are running around, you know, in their head or that they're listening to externally? Yeah, I mean, to me, it all gets down to outcomes over actions. It's a concept that I talk about a lot, but is what is the outcome that you're trying to achieve? And find somebody who already has achieved that outcome. If you want to listen to anybody, don't listen to somebody who's not achieved the outcome that you want. But if you find somebody who has achieved the outcome that you want, then absolutely listen to their advice, listen to what works for them or what works for their clients, but know that that does not mean it's going to work in the exact same way for you. Take the inspiration from it, but make it your own. And so one of the things that I do with all my clients is what I call an RFL. It's your rich, fulfilled life. And it's going through and looking at when do you want to work and when, you know, what do you want to do? Like, what are the things that fuel you and align to your zone of genius versus the things that drain you and should be either delegated or deleted off your plate? Um, What are the things that you want to create protected space for? Some of my clients are big meditators, are really big into exercise. Others love to cook healthy meals and they need to carve up space every day day to do that cooking. Um, Me, I love Pilates. If I don't make room for Pilates every day, I just am not at my best. And so we look at what are those things. And then this is the important thing is you, I think you have to play to your natural strengths. So I am at my very best in the morning. So it's taken me a long time to find a quick but effective morning routine that lets me do what I need to do so I could start work early because that's when I'm at my absolute best. And then at the end of the day, I have other habits and routines in place when I'm no longer going to be at my best from a work perspective. Um, And I think that that's the key is you have to figure out, A, what is that rich, fulfilled life for you? When do you want to work? But most importantly, when are you at your best and how can you play to your strengths and listen, listen to what other people say, but run it through the filter of you and what's right for you. And don't feel like you need to prescriptively do anything that anybody tells you. And just a little side note, if somebody says there's literally only one way to do something, I would find somebody else to listen to. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Wonderful advice. Well, as we come to a close, Chris, I would love for you to share an example or two of a client that you have worked with. Tell us about, you know, what problem they came to you with, what your intervention was like with them, and then what was the positive result or benefit they had afterwards? Yeah, I'll share one of my clients who I started working with um, right at the beginning of the year. I think we did our first session back in December Um, and we had done a a one day session and then I continue to support her each month um, throughout the year. But when she came to me, she was starting to feel a bit out of alignment with her business model. She was working really, really hard. She had had a pretty serious medical diagnosis, which was causing her to kind of rethink her priorities and rethink her life and realize, wait a minute. I'm working way too hard, spending time doing things that I don't want to be doing. I really want to reimagine what I'm doing. So, and she also was looking at 10 years from now, she wants to be able to sell her business. So what could she be doing now is she's looking at her strategic plans to set herself up for the results that she wants long-term. So what we did is we spent a day together and we did a few different things. But one of the things we did was we defined her rich, fulfilled life. We looked at her long-term vision. We looked at what her vision was for exiting out of her company and how much money she wanted to make. We looked at her big, like aspirational uh, business bucket list type items. Like she wants to write another book. She wants to do a TED talk. She has all of these things. She wants to launch a podcast. And so we looked at all of those different things and we mapped out what that might look like. And then we looked at her schedule. And this is super important. And I actually have a free download that I'm happy to share um, with your listeners that they might find valuable, but it's the exact thing that I did with her. But we looked at her schedule and we said, okay, now that we know where you want to go, now that we know what's important, let's look at where you're spending your time. How much of this does not support that? And 
we made so many changes to her schedule. We also, I'm a big fan of focus blocking. So we looked at how to focus, put her work into focus blocks and batch more so that not only was she cutting things from her calendar, but she was being more efficient and more effective in the time that she was working. And she ended up going from working pretty much around the clock and never taking a break to working Monday through Thursday and only working with clients in the afternoons and having protected space every single morning for her to work on her business. And in Q1, she did more in revenue than she did in the entire year last year. Um, and she's on track to 2.5 her revenue by the end of the year. Um, so that's one client and one example of what we did together. And it was really just getting back to that reimagining her business model and then looking at where she was focusing and what she was doing and making sure that the things she was focused on were in alignment with where she wanted to go. Because I can't tell you how many people there's a big disconnect there. Mm -hmm. I love that, looking at the calendar. So tell us about this resource that you have and also how can my listeners connect with you? Because I know so many of them will want to uh, learn more about you, your services, your podcast, which I highly recommend, and uh, anything else you'd like to share about what, where people can um, learn more about you. Yeah, absolutely. So my, my website's leanoutmethod.com. And when you're there, you can get to my podcast or you can head to leanoutpodcast.com. Um, but the free download that I mentioned, it's what I call the visionary leader schedule. And so it's really looking at how you can structure your day in such a way to be as effective and to be as efficient as possible. And people are sometimes really surprised that just by looking at things through some slightly different lenses, they can get a lot of time back even mm -hmm. without leaning out and eliminating things, but you add leaning out on top of it. And a lot of my clients are able to get back 10 plus hours per week. And so this guide kind of walks you through that. It also gives you some templates um, that you can go ahead and use. And so that's at leanoutmethod.com slash visionary. Visionary. Okay. And we'll be sure and put that on our show notes page for people to be able to download later. So that is leanoutmethod.com slash visionary. Is that right? Yes. Excellent. Well, Krista, this has just been such a rich discussion. Thank you so much. I love the passion that you bring to this. Clearly, you enjoy what you do. And, and I know from our earlier conversations how committed you are to the success of your clients. So any of my listeners who are you know, struggling with overwhelm and really looking at how can I lean out my business. Boy, Krista is such a great resource and I highly recommend you reach out to her. Krista, thank you for the difference you're making in the lives of so many people with sharing your wisdom in interviews like this and just the various resources you've created, like this wonderful planner, which I highly recommend people pick up and they can get that at your website too, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Leanoutmethod.com is your hub to all things, Krista. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, Krista, thank you again. It's been such a joy to get to talk with you today. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for tuning in to the Strong for Performance podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com slash free and grab our ebook, Listen Like a Pro. You'll find out how to connect on a deeper level with the people who matter to you. And while you're there, check out our two books, Connect With Your Team and Peer Coaching Made Simple. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell.